Last year, Biden said this. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's a commitment we made. But then just this year, the U.S. Secretary of State just backtracked Biden's comment and said this. We do not support Taiwan independence. We remain opposed to any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. Why is the USA all of a sudden betraying Taiwan? It has to do with the law signed after World War II. But to truly understand this complicated web of diplomacy, we have to start from the beginning. We're sure most of you know the story of Taiwan, so we'll keep it brief. Now, the history of China and Taiwan is long, just like any other history. So we're gonna speed through it a little. In the 1800s, Taiwan was part of the Qing Empire, which basically ruled over all of current China and Taiwan. But in 1895, Japanese forces took over Taiwan, defeating the Qing government in the First Sino-Japanese War. And this is where we shift the focus to mainland China and skip forward a little. In 1912, the Republic of China, or the ROC, overthrew the Qing Empire and took control of mainland China. Remember this name, the ROC, as this is important to this day. Around the end of World War II, the ROC meets with the USA and UK and mentions to them, hey, Japan is controlling Taiwan, but it's kind of part of China. So while you guys are negotiating Japan's surrender, if you can throw in return of Taiwan to the ROC, we would really appreciate that. So the ROC, the current government of China, has complete control over mainland China and Taiwan. But while the ROC is distracted by all this, a full-scale civil war is started by the communist army, whose leader is this guy, Mao Zedong. After winning, he set up the People's Republic of China, or PROC, which eventually became the CCP. Now, the old government ROC flees mainland China and takes over Taiwan. We know it's a lot of acronyms, but we promise this will help make sense of current tensions. Now, at this point, both of these governments considered Taiwan to be part of China, but they disagreed on who is the true government of China. ROC claimed that they are the legitimate government of China, and PRC claimed they were the legitimate government. Now, Mao wasn't too happy with the old government taking a piece of China from him, so he decided to invade Taiwan, but lost. This was around the same time the outbreak of the Korean War and the US realized the strategic importance of Taiwan in having influence in Asia. So US President Harry S. Truman sent the US 7th Fleet to the Taiwan Strait to prevent an invasion of the island by communist armies from the mainland. At that time, due to the divide between the United States and the Soviet Union, the world split into communist and capitalist democratic blocs. Taiwan leader, Xiang, stood with the democratic blocs, and the United States and other Western countries supported his government's bid to represent China diplomatically and in the United Nations, and various other international organizations. In fact, the US recognized ROC as the legitimate government of China at this point. The US support for Taiwan was part of its broader policy of containment of communism, which sought to prevent the spread of Soviet and Chinese influence in Asia. The US saw Taiwan as a strategic ally and a bulwark against the spread of communism in the region. Three years later, after the first Taiwan Strait Crisis where the PLA shelled the Taiwanese islands near its coast, Washington signed a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. It even went as far as to threaten a nuclear attack on China to show that it was serious about defending the island's sovereignty. Then in 1958, the second Taiwan Strait Crisis took place when the PRC shelled nationalist outposts of Kingman and Matsu Islands off the coast of Fujian province, after which the United States again intervened by sending ships into the Taiwan Strait. Two years later in 1960, Dwight Eisenhower became the first U.S. head of state to pay an official visit to a Chinese government when he met with Xiang Jieshi in Taiwan in June. Around the same time, tensions started boiling over between CCP and the Soviet Union. When CCP leaders took over the mainland, a friendly and productive relationship between Moscow and Beijing was considered vital for the advancement of world socialism. In late 1949, Mao traveled to Moscow to meet Joseph Stalin for the first time. Recognizing the need for unity, Stalin and Mao signed a bilateral treaty called the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. It included a military alliance that required one to come to the other's aid if they were attacked. More important to China were the treaty's economic benefits, including a $300 million loan and the provision of Soviet technical advisors. During the 1950s, thousands of scientists, industry experts, and technicians from the Soviet Union lived and worked in China. Their advice and leadership played an important role in the industrialization of China, using the advice of the Soviet economic strategists. Beijing committed itself to Stalinist models of development, growth, and agricultural collectivization. Yet during this successful collaboration, there were also signs of strain. Mao's 1949 visit to Russia negotiated a successful treaty, but privately, Mao felt undervalued and disrespected. 
The Chinese leader believed that Stalin had treated him as an underling rather than an important partner. In mid-1950, Mao committed forces to the Korean War, believing that Stalin would follow suit and commit Soviet forces and provide men, machinery, and weapons. Stalin, however, preferred not to be drawn into an open conflict with the United States. He confined Soviet involvement in Korea to providing air support and supplying aircraft, weapons, and munitions, for which he charged Mao's government full price. The Korean War was politically successful for the Chinese, but the costs to its struggling economy were enormous. Mao felt exploited and betrayed by Stalin, who had failed to honor his earlier assurances. After Stalin's death in 1953, Mao began to imagine himself as the world's senior communist leader. In the Soviet Union, leadership passed to Nikita Khrushchev, a party official who had previously shown unflinching loyalty to Stalin. This changed in February 1956, when Khrushchev delivered his famous secret speech, in which he condemned the personality cult, disposition, show trials, purges, and violence that occurred under Stalinism. For Mao, Khrushchev's secret speech was a betrayal of Stalin's legacy. Chinese communists responded by developing their own interpretation of Stalin, which was articulated in the People's Daily on April 5, 1956. Claiming that Stalin was a great Marxist, and he made mistakes that should be fixed. Sino-Soviet relations began to deteriorate shortly after, in part because of Khrushchev's softer line toward the West. While Mao had always attacked the United States as an imperialist bully to be feared and resisted, Khrushchev suggested that peaceful coexistence with the U.S. was possible. Khrushchev visited China in July 1958, but the meeting did not go well. The Soviet leader and his entourage were housed in dilapidated apartments without air conditioning, despite the sweltering heat. During the talks, Mao treated Khrushchev with arrogance and disdain, not dissimilar to how Mao had been treated by Stalin in 1949. Mao refused to consider Khrushchev's proposed joint defense projects. Khrushchev retaliated by pulling the majority of Soviet advisors out of China. Khrushchev visited China again the following year and infuriated Mao with a speech that praised U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower and his foreign policy. This particular trip was so acrimonious that it trimmed from seven days to just three. Then in 1960, Moscow began to repudiate terms of the 1949 military alliance, and within a year, the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance, and Mutual Assistance was all but dead, and the split seemed complete when the USSR recalled its last scientific and technical advisors from the PRC and cut off all assistance. Things got so bad between the communist nations, and they considered going to war. This is when President Kennedy administration considered opening ties with the PRC to fight the bigger problem at the time, the Soviet Union. This was more of an enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation. Assistant Secretary of State Roger Hillsman hinted for the first time in a public speech that United States wished to improve relations with the PRC. But no concrete progress was made since the US and PRC soon found each other on the opposite sides of the Vietnam War. The US government decided to escalate its involvement in Vietnam in the wake of the Tonkin Gulf incident. In early August 1964, two US destroyers stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam radioed that they had been fired upon by North Vietnamese forces. In response to these reported incidents, President Lyndon B. Johnson requested permission from the U.S. Congress to increase the U.S. military presence in Indochina. The large and growing U.S. presence in Vietnam posed a potential threat to the PRC, which began to send more military and technical assistance to the North Vietnamese. At the same time, Chinese engaged in mass demonstrations accusing the United States of imperialist actions. The same year, the PRC successfully tested its first atomic bomb and emerged as a nuclear power in its own right. This, of course, made Taiwan more worried about its safety. Over the next few years, the anti-war movement in the United States gained strength and the government heavily considered withdrawing from Vietnam and reducing U.S. military presence in Asia altogether. In fact, President Nixon ran on these platforms and won, thus reducing U.S. presence in Asia, which included a stoppage to regular patrols U.S. Navy made in Taiwan Straits. This opened the door for the official relationship building with the PRC, and after several rounds of backdoor diplomacy through go-betweens, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger made a secret trip to the PRC in 1970 in order to meet with Zhao Enlai and other senior Chinese leaders to pave the way for a visit by President Nixon. He then made a second public trip in the fall to finalize arrangements. These trips marked the reopening of direct ties between Washington and Beijing after more than 20 years of non-recognition. Eventually in 1971, the Chinese seat in the United Nations was transferred from the Republic of China in Taiwan to the 
People's Republic of China. A year later, President Nixon arrived in Beijing, the first American head of state ever to set foot on the Chinese mainland. Nixon, Kissinger, and others met with Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai, and at the end of the week-long visit, the two sides issued the Shanghai Communique. In this document, the United States and China stated their positions on a number of issues, including joint opposition to the Soviet Union, the U.S. intention to withdraw its military from Taiwan, and U.S. support for a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. This began the process of full normalization of relations between the United States and the PRC. But Communique was a stroke of diplomatic genius. Let's dig into the details real quick. The Communique pledged both countries to work for normalization of relations and to expand people-to-people -people contacts and trade opportunities, in a not-so-thinly-veiled reference to the Soviet Union. The Communique declared that neither nation should seek hegemony in the Asia-Pacific region, and each is opposed to efforts by any other country or group of countries to establish such hegemony. Early in the negotiations, recognizing that China and the U.S. held many irreconcilable positions, Zhao Inlai proposed an unorthodox format for the Communique. The two sides essentially agreed to disagree, each stating its views in separate paragraphs when necessary. On the thorny Vietnam issue, for example, the U.S. endorsed Nixon's latest peace plan, while China expressed firm support for the Communist proposal. Yet despite the plan for unilateral declarations, Taiwan remained a stumbling block throughout the negotiations. While the U.S. sought improved relations with Beijing, it still officially recognized Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government in Taiwan. In fact, the U.S. had been inching toward a two-China's policy for years. Only four months earlier, when the United Nations voted on whether to admit the People's Republic of China, the U.S. reversed its 20-year opposition to seating the PRC, but opposed any effort to expel Taiwan. Ultimately, the U.S. lost the fight for dual representation. The PRC gained admission to the U.N., Taiwan was ousted, and the U.S. was left to juggle relations with two countries that both saw themselves as the sole legitimate government of all of China. The Chinese regarded the presence of American troops on Taiwan as a violation of China's sovereignty and pressed for full U.S. military withdrawal from the island. Nixon and Kissinger wanted to condition a withdrawal on enlisting China's help in ending the Vietnam War. And while China viewed its dealings with Taiwan as a strictly internal issue to be handled as it saw fit, the Americans insisted that the Chinese resolve the Taiwan question without the use of force. In the end, both sides made concessions. As Henry Kissinger wrote in his memoirs, neither the U.S. nor China was willing to let the Taiwan issue become an obstacle to their emerging new relationship. The basic theme of the Nixon trip and the Shanghai Communique was to put off the issue of Taiwan for the future to enable the two nations to close the gulf of 20 years and to pursue parallel policies where their interests coincided. The U.S. declared its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves and affirmed a total U.S. military withdrawal from the island as an ultimate objective. The U.S. also agreed to progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan as the tension in the area diminishes, thereby giving China a stake in the abatement of the Vietnam War. For its part, the PRC firmly rejected any two China's formulation, declaring unequivocally that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China, and Taiwan is a province of China. The U.S., in deaf phrasing, acknowledged that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintained there is but one China and that Taiwan is part of China, but neatly avoided the question of who should govern this one China. But surprisingly, Nixon and Kissinger went significantly further on Taiwan in their private talks with Xiao than in the Communique. As recently released notes and transcripts reveal, the Americans offered Xiao extensive assurances that they intended to open full diplomatic relations with Beijing as soon as possible and were willing to sacrifice Taiwan to do so. In the wake of the Watergate scandal, however, Nixon was unable to carry through on these promises, and the U.S. didn't establish full diplomatic relations with the PRC until 1979, as we will soon get into. In 1974, Nixon was forced to resign because of Watergate, and in 1976, Mao passed away. This change in leadership delayed the normalization of relationships. After Deng Xiaoping took control of leadership in China, he restarted the negotiations on normalization. After several roadblocks in 1978, the two governments finally issued a joint communique that established full diplomatic relations. By this agreement, the United States recognized the PRC as the sole government of China and acknowledged that Taiwan is a part of China. At the same time, the United States ended official relations and its defense treaty with the nationalist regime on Taiwan. All in all, this communique reaffirmed most of what was decided in 1972 Shanghai Communique. 
The U.S. statement was careful to be vague. It acknowledged the PRC position that Taiwan is part of China. It did not accept that Taiwan is a part of China, just acknowledged. The U.S. was forced to break diplomatic ties with Taiwan, but it did its best to soften the blow. In the statement, the U.S. made sure to emphasize that the American people and the people of Taiwan will maintain commercial, cultural, and other relations without official government representation and without diplomatic relations. The United States is confident that the people of Taiwan face a peaceful and prosperous future. The United States continues to have an interest in the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue and expects that the Taiwan issue will be settled peacefully by the Chinese themselves. PRC, on the other hand, willfully ignored the use of acknowledgement by the USA. In his statement, the PRC said that the USA accepts that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China and Taiwan is part of China. As for the way of bringing Taiwan back to the embrace of the motherland and reunifying the country, it is entirely China's internal affair. The US did all it could to keep the PRC happy, all while never actually giving up on Taiwan. The PRC, on the other hand, was more than happy to take the U.S. statements as full recognition and run with it. This started the officially unofficial U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity. There was no agreement over the status of Taiwan, just ambiguity, and that was by design. This, of course, didn't please the Taiwanese government, which was said in the statement. In the past few years, the United States government has repeatedly reaffirmed its intention to maintain diplomatic relations with the Republic of China and to honor its treaty agreements. Now that it has broken the assurances and abrogated the treaty, the United States government cannot be expected to have the confidence of any free nation in the future. The U.S. soon fixed this issue too. Later the same year, 1979, President Carter enacted the Taiwan Relations Act, which committed the United States to provide military and other support to Taiwan and provided guidelines for future trade and other relations. This made the PRC unhappy, so there were more negotiations over the Third Communique, where the United States agreed to reduce its arms sales to Taiwan and China agreed to emphasize a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. However, the Reagan administration offered private assurances to Taiwan that it would continue to support the island and its government. The next year, Deng Xiaoping proposed the one country, two systems approach for reunification with both Hong Kong and Taiwan. This one country, two systems option said that it would allow Taiwan significant autonomy if it agreed to come under Beijing's control. This system underpinned Hong Kong's return to China in 1997, and the manner in which it was governed until recently, when Beijing finally sought to increase its influence. China pledged to preserve much of what makes Hong Kong unique when the former British colony was handed over more than two decades ago. Beijing said it would give Hong Kong 50 years to keep its capitalist system and enjoy many freedoms not found in mainland Chinese cities. But alas, that was not the case. Beijing has been chipping away at Hong Kong's freedom since the handover. For instance, in 2003, the Hong Kong government proposed national security legislation that would have prohibited treason, secession, sedition, and subversion against the Chinese government. In 2012, it tried to amend Hong Kong schools' curricula to foster Chinese national identity, which many residents saw as Chinese propaganda. And in 2014, Beijing proposed a framework for universal suffrage, allowing Hong Kongers to vote for the city's chief executive, but only from a Beijing-approved shortlist of candidates. Protesters organized massive rallies known as the Umbrella Movement to call for true democracy. In the years following the 2014 protests, Beijing and the Hong Kong government stepped up efforts to rein in dissent, including by prosecuting protest leaders, expelling several new legislators, and increasing media censorship. Beijing took its most assertive action yet on June 30, 2020, when it bypassed the Hong Kong legislator and imposed a national security law in the city. The legislation effectively criminalizes any dissent and adopts extremely broad definitions for crimes such as terrorism, subversion, secession, and collusion with foreign powers. It also allows Beijing to establish a security force in Hong Kong and influence the selection of judges who hear national security cases. Pro-democracy activists and lawmakers decreed the move and expressed fears that it could be the end of Hong Kong. Meanwhile, Chinese officials and pro-Beijing lawmakers said it was necessary to restore stability following the massive protests. Authorities have used the law to try to eliminate all forms of political opposition. They disqualified pro-democracy candidates from running in elections and removed elected lawmakers for publicly opposing China's control over Hong Kong. Police have arrested at least 170 people under the law, many of them prominent pro-democracy activists, former lawmakers, and journalists. 
thousands more people have been arrested for participating in the 2019 protests. Beijing and the Hong Kong government have also curbed media freedoms, with pro-democracy publications such as the Apple Daily newspaper closing after journalists were harassed and jailed. Moreover, groups that organized protests disbanded. The Hong Kong government's efforts to transform the public education system by introducing so-called patriotic programs have also troubled many parents and students. These moves have by and large ended mass public protests and silenced many Hong Kong residents who fought for democracy. Thousands of people, including prominent activists, have fled the city. Following another weekend of protests. Police are clashing with protesters in Hong Kong. Or trying to stop a controversial proposed law. About 30,000 demonstrators against traders from mainland China. Tension between the two sides has heightened in recent weeks. China is accused of snooping on its neighbor. Taiwanese authorities have detained four military officers. Why are officers within the Taiwanese military spying for China? Yeah, so it didn't go as planned in Hong Kong, and Taiwan saw this coming and rejected the offer back then. All the while, China-U.S. relations took a hit too, after what happened at Tiananmen Square in 1989. The United States and other nations imposed economic sanctions on China, and many U.S. citizens evacuated the country. President George H.W. Bush maintained communications with senior Chinese leaders, and twice sent Brent Scowcroft and Lawrence Eagleburger on secret missions to Beijing to reassure Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese leadership that the United States would maintain ties. Tensions continued into the next year, with criticisms aired from both sides, although diplomatic ties were never severed and China remained open to foreign trade. Shifting focus to another parallel story, U.S.'s ambiguity isn't the only thing as ambiguous in China-Taiwan relationship. Both countries themselves have a deal whose ambiguity has caused tensions among them. In the 1980s, China and Taiwan opened up to each other after 40 years of no contact. Both sides set up semi-official organizations to regulate the growing numbers of exchanges across the Taiwan Strait. In 1992, these organizations reached a compromise on the nature of cross-strait ties that the KMT would eventually name the 1992 Consensus. The consensus rests on agreement between Taiwan's ruling party, KMT, and the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, that there is only one China. Though both sides define China differently, CCP claims that during this consensus, Taiwanese leaders agreed that Taiwan is part of China, which is technically true, but Taiwanese leaders did claim that China belongs to the government of Taiwan, not the PRC. While all of this was going on, Taiwan started to find its own identity. Citizens in Taiwan now consider themselves Taiwanese and not Chinese, and the Taiwanese government actually has no problem leaving mainland China to the CCP. It just doesn't want the CCP in Taiwan. In fact, in 1994, Taiwan held its first ever democratic election to elect its leaders. To oppose democracy and Taiwanese people having the right to vote, China gathered up a bunch of troops and military equipment on the shore nearest to Taiwan and started a show of force. This is when Washington shows up to protect Taiwan, as promised by U.S. law. The U.S. Navy brings out all of its biggest and most advanced ships, missiles, and jets. This was just to send the message that a war with Taiwan meant a war with the world's most powerful military. China was forced to ease up and tensions calm back down. Now, as if democracy in a Chinese-claimed region wasn't bad enough, in 2000, the new president openly backed independence from China. This scared the CCP and they made a new law, the anti-secession law, stating China's right to use non-peaceful means against Taiwan if it tried to secede from China. As if they hadn't tried military action before? Because of their open support for independence, the DPP party has been nicknamed the pro-independence party, and when they're in power in Taiwan, China becomes more and more aggressive with their threats towards Taiwan. 
Since early 2000, things have changed in Taiwan. Its transition from authoritarian rule to a representative electoral system was gradual and peaceful. Now, Taiwan has a healthy democracy with two main political parties, the DPP and the KMT. As mentioned before, DPP is the pro-independence party, and KMT is often referred to as a pro-reunification party. Much like USA politics, the nicknames often don't tell the full story. But before going over that, let's quickly cover Taiwan's economic growth and how China's issue plays into that. Taiwan is slightly bigger than the US state of Maryland, or about half the size of Scotland, and has a population of 23 million, which is just over a quarter of Germany's population. Economically though, Taiwan is punching way above its weight. In 2021, Taiwan GDP per capita was $33,000, about three times as high as China, which has only $12,000 of GDP per capita. Even though Taiwan is much richer than China, it's still heavily dependent on the mainland. China is Taiwan's most important trading partner, followed by the United States. More than 42% of Taiwan's exports go to China, from where Taiwan gets around 22% of its imports. In 2020, goods and services worth $166 billion were exchanged between the two countries. This all started when, supposedly, pro-China party KMT won the Taiwanese presidency in 2008. Between 2008 to 2014, Taiwan signed more than 20 pacts with the PRC, including the 2010 Cross-Straits Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, in which they agreed to lift barriers to trade. China and Taiwan resumed direct sea, air, and mail links that had been banned for decades. They also agreed to allow banks, insurers, and other financial service providers to work in both markets. CCP believed that the more dependent Taiwan becomes on China, the easier it would be to integrate the country into CCP rule. But unfortunately for the CCP, that's not how things panned out. In 2014, KMT and CCP tried to sign a cross-strait service trade agreement, CSSTA, a follow-up treaty from ECFA. This would start to list out the areas in which the corporations from each side can invest and work in, but many young people in Taiwan opposed this agreement. On the evening of March 18, 2014, a group of Taiwanese students stormed the national legislator with demands to renege the CSSTA. Unexpectedly, their hastily planned action evolved into a 24-day confrontation. The so-called Sunflower Movement, named after the floral gifts sent to protesters as a symbol of hope, won widespread public sympathy in Taiwan. Thousands of supporters camped on the streets surrounding the legislator, which made it difficult for the government to evict the intruders. Yet the government refused to accept demands from the protesters to postpone the free trade agreement. Seeing that the movement was losing steam, student leaders opted for a voluntary withdrawal and claimed to have achieved partial success. To these young protesters, China's growing sharp power in Taiwan was clearly felt in the steady erosion of press freedom, academic freedom, and other individual political rights. The Sunflower Movement became a political trigger point precisely because the disputed push for trade liberalization with China was perceived to benefit big corporations at the expense of individuals. Consequently, many citizens feared that closer economic integration with China would compromise Taiwan's political autonomy and self-governing status. The Sunflower Movement had far-reaching political reverberations. Humiliated by internal divisions and its inability to solve the political crisis, the KMT suffered back-to-back -back electoral defeats. The so-called pro-independence Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, won the presidency and the legislative majority in a landslide in January 2016. Once the DDP won the presidency in 2016, they quickly got to work on solving the dependency on China. President Xia has had some success boosting trade with and investment in countries in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific through a signature initiative, the New Southbound Policy. Trade between Taiwan and the 18 targeted countries nearly doubled between 2016, when the initiative was unveiled, and 2022. Taiwanese investment in those countries has also steadily increased. In 2019, Tsai unveiled a three-year plan to incentivize Taiwanese manufacturers to move from mainland back to Taiwan. Still in 2021, Taiwan's exports to China hit an all-time high. Beijing has pressured countries not to sign free trade agreements with Taiwan. A handful of countries have signed free trade pacts with the island. New Zealand and Singapore are the only developed economies to sign such agreements. Beijing has also pushed for Taiwan's exclusion from multilateral trading blocs, including the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. All the while, Taiwan is working toward becoming less dependent on China. China is only growing stronger and stronger, economically and militarily. 
Since its acceptance to the World Trade Organization, China's economy has boomed. This has enabled the CCP to strengthen its military and flex its muscle geopolitically around the world. The Chinese military budget has increased fivefold since 2021, and it now fields the world's largest missile force, the second largest navy, and the third largest air force. Of course, it would be wrong of us to not mention the goal of Chinese leader Xi Jinping. His goal is to become the greatest leader in China's history. He wants to achieve that by doing something that has never been done before, the great unification of the Chinese nation. He wants to bring Taiwan back under China peacefully, but while showing off tanks in the military. It is pretty similar to when you are getting mugged and the guy flashes his gun but says, I don't want any problems, just give me your wallet. So whenever there are talks about Taiwan independence, it gives China a perfect excuse to flex its muscles. Now here's where the problems start. Even though the Taiwan's president openly backed independence in 2000, that's not the case anymore. Nor do the Taiwanese citizens want independence. Most recent surveys show that only 5% of Taiwanese want independence. The vast majority, around 82%, just want the status quo to continue. That strategic ambiguity. They just want peace and freedom. Even DPP leader and current President Tsai has tiptoed around enraging China. She has reaffirmed that Taiwan has no need to declare independence. Instead, she has attempted to find another formulation that will be acceptable to Beijing. But she isn't looking for a compromise. In a 2019 speech, she reiterated China's long-standing proposal for Taiwan that it be incorporated into the mainland under the formula of one country, two systems. This is the same formula used for Hong Kong, which was guaranteed the ability to preserve its political and economic systems and granted a high degree of autonomy. Such a framework is deeply unpopular among the Taiwanese public. Pointing to Beijing's recent crackdown on Hong Kong's freedoms, Tsai and even the KMT have rejected the one country, two systems framework. This, of course, has pushed Xi and PLA to use more and more force to intimidate Taiwan. The Chinese military is waging what defense experts call a gray zone campaign. It is increasing its presence closer to Taiwan one step at a time, yet all the while remaining below the threshold of what could be considered an act of war. Since September 2020, when Taiwan first started publishing data on Chinese military activity in its air defense identification zone, the number of monthly incursions into Taiwan's ADIZ by the PLA has ballooned from 69 to 139 this July. An ADIZ is a self-declared buffer zone in international airspace in which countries monitor flight movements for potential security threats. But as the airspace above the contiguous zone is outside Taiwan's jurisdiction, the PLA's behavior does not violate international law. Over the past three years, Beijing has gone from occasional flights into Taiwan's ADIZ by one or two military reconnaissance or transport aircraft to almost daily incursions by often large groups of planes including bombers, fighters, electronic warfare aircraft, aerial refueling planes, and various kinds of drones. In addition, the PLA has expanded its area of operations from mainly the southwestern corner of Taiwan's ADIZ, the crossroads between the shallow Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, and the Bashi Channel which connects both to the open Pacific, to the airspace and waters all around Taiwan. Then, after a hiatus of almost two years, the PLA flew more than 300 such crossings in August last year during the unprecedented exercises it held around Taiwan to punish it for hosting then-U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. PLA officers boasted on Chinese state television that they had successfully obliterated the median line. Since then, dozens of PLA aircraft have crossed the line each month. After the PLA aircraft approached its contiguous zone last month, Taiwanese defense officials worry it will be the next line the Chinese military crosses. Although the U.S. Navy has continued its regular transits up and down the Taiwan Strait, there has been no direct response to these Chinese moves by the U.S. military. The U.S. administration continues to debate on how best to apply its policy of strategic ambiguity. New form of this policy is making sure that Beijing knows the U.S. will defend Taiwan if there was an invasion, but also not provoke Beijing into invading by irresponsibly supporting Taiwanese independence. The only issue with this strategy is it only works as long as China believes that the U.S. will intervene and the U.S. military overpowers the Chinese military. As Beijing's military capabilities have increased, pivotal deterrence has steadily faltered. In 1996, Beijing fired missiles over the island to protest the Taiwanese president speaking at his college reunion in the United States. But it avoided further provocation after Washington sailed two aircraft carriers through the strait. After Pelosi's 2022 trip to Taiwan, China responded with military exercises and missile overflights. Washington restricted itself to verbal condemnation and avoided any military displays, even as the Chinese People's Liberation Army has continued its coercion and incursions. 
Further strategic ambiguity is largely irrelevant to whether China decides to attack Taiwan. Many experts believe China has already priced in a full U.S. defense. Its operational plans assume Washington will intervene. U.S. and allied power, not ambiguity, is what deters China ambiguity by itself, offers little additional benefit. That means that if anything is likely to deter Chinese aggression, it is further improvements to the Taiwan security. Strategic ambiguity could cause more harm than good on this front as well. U.S. intervention is essential to defeating a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Taipei must ensure that the United States shows up and arms sale are the clearest and strongest indication of U.S. support. Taipei purchases high-end weapon systems, believing that Washington's willingness to sell these platforms raises the likelihood that it will step in to defend the island. Taiwan's best strategy is an asymmetric porcupine defense, which is embodied in a Taiwanese military plan called the Overall Defense Concept. The island would bristle with mines and anti-ship, anti-air, and anti-vehicle missiles, buying time for the U.S. military to arrive. However, high-end equipment like F-16 aircraft, heavy tanks, and submarines are useless for this mission. They are likely to be destroyed in any invasion's opening salvo. But Taipei cannot fully switch to asymmetric defense because strategic ambiguity leaves it uncertain whether Washington will intervene. This creates a U.S. problem in Taiwanese politics. Former Taiwanese President Mai ying Jiao stated, The Americans will sell us weapons and provide us with intelligence, but they won't send troops. KMT, his political party, is skeptical of Washington's intentions, prompting some members to advocate greater autonomy in Taiwan's defense decisions. If this were to happen in Taiwan, Washington would lose a critical partner in strategic competition with China. Beijing could use Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier to project power into the Pacific, choke off U.S. support to China and South Korea, dominate the Philippines, and further consolidate control over the South China Sea. Strategic ambiguity seems to have snared the United States and Taiwan in a prisoner's dilemma. Washington wants Taipei to increase defense spending and implement its porcupine strategy before making further unspecified commitments. Taiwan spends a larger proportion of its government budget on defense than even the United States, but it wants to receive the U.S. commitment its defense concept depends on before further implementation. The Taiwanese will to fight increases significantly if Washington intervenes. Each side's strategy hinges on the other's actions, and each side is stuck waiting while China continues modernizing its military.